It is so good to be here. This is my first time ever in Korea, and it is wonderful here. It is beautiful. I am enjoying it. I have to go back tomorrow. I, I really want to come back. Um, I just had bulgogi and kimchi, and I have always loved ch uh, Korean food, and now I'm actually getting real Korean food in Korea. It is so exciting for me. And I'm, everyone has been so friendly and so warm and welcoming, and I really appreciate that. I said that last night, too. Um, I don't know. Was anyone there last night? Yeah. Oh, good. We're all new people. Oh, wonderful. Cool. I think you might have been there. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, good. Um, so, great. It's great to have new people, too. So, what I thought I would do is just tell you a little bit about some of the things that we're doing in our ledger that are interesting. So, I understand that we have people that are technical and that are interested in the deep things about blockchain and about ledgers. And so I thought I would show you just briefly how the Hashgraph algorithm works, a tiny piece of it, and then talk about our ledger and when you use it, how it is some interesting features that it has. So if you wanted to write a, a DAP or a program that calls our API, here are some interesting things you might want to use. So, if you'd like, we'll do that tonight. Interesting Hedera features. So the idea in this ledger is that when you have a transaction, Alice there has a transaction, we will assume that the ledger is these computers. These are the nodes, those are the computers, and we have a transaction that needs to come in and be processed from Alice. Maybe it is moving cryptocurrency from one account to another, or maybe it is running a smart contract or storing a file. What we do is gossip it. Alice picks someone at random and sends the transaction to Dave. And then each of them picks someone at random and send it to Bob and Gina. And then they pick someone at random and everyone has it. And it's exponentially fast. Gossip is very fast. Now if Bob and Carol both have a transaction, we have two transactions that need to go out. They do not take turns. They do not talk to a leader. All they do is gossip at the same time. So both of them send to a random computer, and those send to random computers, and so on and so on. And it goes to two, then four, eight, 16. It exponentially goes out until everyone has Bob and Carol's. The problem is what order do we want to put the transactions? We need a consensus on the order. Bob has them in this order. Carol has them in this order. The order is different. We need to figure out a consensus order for the group. The way we can do it is to have each of the computers say when they first received each of these messages. So they say the time when they first received this message and the time when they first received this one and this one. If you have the time that each computer received it, just look at the times and put them in a list. This is when each of the computers received the green message. This is when each of the computers received the blue message, and they are sorted. And when you sort the list, you can take the middle one. <coughs> this is when the green message had reached half of the world. This is when the majority of the world heard the green message. This is when the majority of the world heard the blue message, 
This is when the majority of the world heard the red message. This is a consensus timestamp for that message. We can take those consensus timestamps and we can sort the messages by the order of the timestamps. So we will say at 1230 was Alice's transaction. At 1231 and 26 seconds is Carol's. At 27 seconds is Bob's. We put the transactions in order by their consensus timestamp. And we get the consensus timestamp by when they reached the majority of the community, the median time. Now we don't count computers that are turned off, so we also have to reach agreement on which computers were turned off. And that is where the Byzantine voting system happens, and I won't go through that right now. But if, aside from that, all we are doing is looking at when the transaction reached each computer, and it happens extremely fast. And so within a few seconds, everyone has consensus on exactly what order to go in and exactly what the timestamp is, and then we process them in that order. And that is it. That is the hash graph algorithm. It is not a chain with proof of work. It is simply using this to reach consensus. And when I said the median of the list, the middle of the list, it is weighted by how much stake each node has. So it is proof of stake. And that's the algorithm. It is very fast because you simply send out your transactions they go out exponentially fast, and then very soon everyone has it, and everyone knows when everyone has it, and we're done. It is asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant, the way it is implemented, the highest level of security. I'm not going to go into more details on that. I have lots of videos you could look at, and we have papers, math papers. It's even been checked. The math proof has been checked by a computer a COQ proof verification. So I won't go through all those details. Uh, those are in other talks and other papers. You can look at that. What I want to talk about tonight is something new that I have not told people before. And you might find it interesting. I don't know. I hope that you find it interesting. What I'm going to talk about tonight are some of the features if you decide you want to use Hedera. If you would like to build a system that makes calls to the Hedera API, and you would like to build dApps on Hedera, these are some of the features of this ledger that are interesting. So I just showed you Hashgraph. That is the consensus algorithm. Now I'm showing you Hedera. That's the layer, the ledger, that was built on that consensus algorithm. So let's go through these. These are several different things. We'll talk about the fair timestamps that we just mentioned, and then we'll talk about how it handles keys and claims and realms and results and state proofs, all sorts of concepts that are in the Hedera ledger. So let's do that. We saw how the timestamps are put on transactions. In some ledgers, a single miner chooses the timestamp. In a proof of work system, whoever manages to make the next block gets to choose the time for it. And there might be constraints. Maybe it can't be earlier than the median of the last 11. There are constraints. But still, they can pick the time the way they want it. In this system, no one computer can affect the time too much. All of the community controls what the time is. They all collaborate. And so the timestamps end up being fair. So why would it be useful to have a ledger where you can count on the timestamp being fair? 
Well, one example is in if you wanted to do atomic swaps. When you do atomic swaps with another ledger, the security of the standard way of doing it comes down to whether you can trust the timestamps. So having a good timestamp is important for atomic swaps. They're useful if you have a stock market. The fairness of ordering is very important. If you had a stock market and you bid on a stock, and then later I bid on the stock, but I could somehow make my bid come before yours, even though I shouldn't, that would be very bad. But here, the ordering is fair. And so you can trust that it's going to be fair what order our transactions come in. And so you can trust a stock market built on top of it. You could use this for cases where it matters or contests or a patent office where whoever files first gets it or even games. If you are playing an online game and an MMO and you try to pick up an object and I try to pick up the same object, who gets it? It's whoever was first. So you want it to be fair in how it decides who was first. <coughs> so this fairness is important. And um, as I said, the fair timestamps are the basis of the fair ordering. So many ledger, I mean, all ledgers put transactions into order and reach consensus on the order. What's important here is that we don't just put it into order, it is fair. If you have a ledger based on a leader, where a leader puts them in, uh, decides what's in the block, then the leader could put them in a wrong order. But here, there is no leader, so you can trust it. Yes? So, would it be possible for this timestamp to be off, or even by a second, for, for a series of transactions? Um, excellent question. Is it possible for the transaction to be off by a second? So, it's an interesting philosophical question. What is off from what? The truth? What is the truth? The truth? As in like when it happened, actually. Yeah. yeah. So the interesting thing is, when did the transaction happen? Well, you'd say, well, when did it reach the computer? Wait, there's more than one computer. There's a whole bunch. Maybe spread around the world. It's kind of an interesting philosophical question. When would I say that a transaction truly reached the community? Is it when it reached the first person in the community? Is it when it reached the last person in the community? I would say that the best way of saying it is, when did it reach the majority of the community? Which is what this is, the median timestamp. Now typically, if you looked at when it reached each person in this room, you would get a bell curve, a normal distribution. What we would find is that a small number of people got it earlier, very early, a small number got it very late, and most of us got it all about the same time. So the median will also be the mean, will also be the mode. They'll be very close to all being the same thing. What if one computer says, I'm going to say I received it a million years ago? Well, they don't really have much effect. In this bell-shaped curve, they're way out on the tail we're still going to end up having the median be one of these people in the big group of people in the middle. And what if a bad computer says, well, I received it a million years in the future? Again, it doesn't matter. They're off on the tail of this, of this curve. When we take the median, we'll still be taking one of the times from that big group of times right at the middle. So the median is great for excluding outliers. And a malicious attack is an outlier. We also have a math theorem that says that more than two thirds of the community, as weighted by the stake, will contribute a time. And we assume that less than a third of the community is dishonest. The whole system breaks if you don't have that assumption. And under that assumption, it guarantees that the median will come from an honest computer or be between the times from two honest computers. So that's mathematically guaranteed, as long as we have less than a third malicious. And like 
<laughs> like all BFT systems, at least the good ones, it can handle up to a, almost a third malicious, but then bad things happen if you get beyond a third. And that's true of all systems if the internet itself can be attacked. Um, even proof of work systems have 51% atta attacks, but they also have 34% attacks. So we're secure up to almost a third. And so the fairness is also secure up to almost a third. And that was a really good question because you have to think, what if someone lies? And the answer is, we don't care, it still works. Okay, I'm gonna continue, but you know, I should have said that. Go ahead and ask questions while I'm talking. I like that. So, that's fair timestamps. There's some uses for it. Not every application needs it. Uh, if I'm just spending cryptocurrency, I don't care about the timestamp. I just want to make sure it gets out there. I want to make sure there's consensus. I want to stop double spending, but I don't care about the timing. But if I'm playing a game, I care about the timing. If I have a stock market, I care about the timing. If we have a contest where we give a prize to the first answer, I care about the timing. So for some cases, you care a lot about the timing. That's what this is good for. Now let's talk about when you do a transaction, you're going to sign it. You have to digitally sign it. If I'm going to send you some cryptocurrency, I have to digitally sign it because otherwise people could steal my cryptocurrency. Our cryptocurrency is called HBARS. So if I want to send you some HBARS, I must sign it. I send it from my account to your account. My account has a key. It's a cryptographic key. It is ED25519. If you know that algorithm, ED25519, it's an encryption or a signature algorithm. That's what we use. Um, actually, we will be supporting RSA and elliptic curve DSA also. With big keys, big, big 3,000 bit RSA uh, and P384 for the, okay, you laugh. <laughs> uh, but yes, we try to be secure. So if Alice has an account with H bars in it, she will have a key. This is her Ed25519 key. And when she sends somebody cryptocurrency, she digitally signs the transaction. Very simple, every ledger does this. This is universal. But here's a fun thing. We can do multi-sig. The account itself, you don't need a smart contract, it's built into the system. The account could have five keys. And we could say any three of these five uh, are, um, are needed in order to make the, make the signature work. So if anyone, want, if anyone wants to send you the money from this account, we need to find at least three of these five people to sign it. So it's a joint account between these five people. Any three can sign it. Really, that black key should have three of five written on it. So imagine that the words three of five were written on it. Actually, they used to be written on it, and now they're not. Sorry. That is a threshold signature, and it is obviously useful. Uh, one way to keep large amounts of cryptocurrency safe is to split it up among multiple people, and they have to cooperate to move the money. So it makes sense to have a threshold signature like that. And of course, you could do other threshold signatures. It doesn't have to be three of five. It could be two of two. This is a joint account between Alice and Bob, and they both have to agree to pull anything out of it. But wait, what if they argue about it? Suppose maybe they are together running a charity that gives money to people, and they have to both agree, but they can't agree on where to send the money. Does that mean that it's just frozen forever? Or what if one of them loses the key? Then they would have be frozen forever. You would never be able to get to the cryptocurrency. What we would like to do is say normally, every day, 
the two of them need to cooperate. But if something unusual happens, they get into an argument and just can't agree for a long time, or one of them loses the key or becomes incapacitated, how can we recover? If they want to, they could set it up differently. They could set it up this way. Here are binding arbitration judges. This is like when you have a real world contract and you say instead of going to the court, you will go to binding arbitration. Actually, I don't know if that's common in this country. Is, is binding arbitration a thing? Does anyone know? Oh. So in the United States, it is very expensive to go to a court and have a judge decide a contract dispute. So we usually write into contracts, you will rent a judge if there's ever a dispute. So if you and I sign a contract, we sign in the contract, we promise not to take this to court. Instead, we will go to a binding arbitration company and we will hire a judge and that judge will judge us. That's what we do in the United States. I don't know how common that is elsewhere. If anyone knows that happens here, raise your hand. I'm very curious. I will take the lack of hands as, I don't know. Okay. So, um, but that's the idea, is that you can rent a judge if there's a problem. So what we might want to do is say, here is a company where you can rent a judge, binding arbitration, and we will say any two of these three judges can overrule what's going on. They can pull the money out of the account. Or, normally, anytime Alice and Bob agree, they can pull the money out of the account. So it's two of two, they both have to agree, and then it's two of three, just some of them have to agree. And then it's as if we have a key made up of two keys, and it's any one of those two. So either Alice and Bob agree, or the judges have two out of three of them agreeing. That's what it takes to pull cryptocurrency out of this account. And you can do this 15 levels deep. It can be very interesting. So Hedera has a council. All 39, more than two thirds, must sign to take cryptocurrency out of the treasury. But a council member is a company. They might have a group of eight officers, any three of which can pull the money out. But one of the officers might actually be a little committee and any four out of the five can pull it out. And so you can make this as complicated as you want. Now you can just have one key. If you want to, you can do that. Hedera lets you give Alice a key or give an account one key and that key works. Or you can have this virtual key, a threshold key that should say three or five, and that works. Or you can make it complicated like this, as deep as you want, 15 levels deep. And in Hedera, anywhere in the entire system that we talk about a key, you're allowed to do this. Everything in the system that uses a key also allows a threshold key and also allows a hierarchy of threshold keys, which is kind of fun. It's fun to think about ways of using this. If you think about it, you start coming up with all sorts of very complicated things where you don't even need a smart contract anymore. It's just inherent in the key structure. You can do very interesting structures without even using a smart contract if you want. So, that's one thing in Pandera that is built into the API that you might like. Let's talk about another one. This one is fun. Smart contracts. We have smart contracts in Solidity. 
If you have ever written a smart contract and run it on another platform like Ethereum, it will run on Hedera with no changes. Take any smart contract on Ethereum, it runs on Hedera the same. That's cool. And what is a smart contract? A smart contract is a small program that you run on the ledger and all of the nodes in the ledger reach an, an agreement, a consensus on what it did. It's a program. And it can actually own cryptocurrency itself. It can control cryptocurrency. So, we put lots of cryptocurrency into this smart contract. We let it run. Oh, I made a mistake. There was a bug in my code. I made a mistake in the program. I just lost a million dollars. How do I get it back? I don't. The code is law. If I made a mistake in my code, I am out of luck. If you wrote the code and very subtly put in a back door that no one noticed, you win. I can't do anything. The code is law. If you like this, we have this. In Hedera, if you create a smart contract and you like this, you can do this. And once you have created the smart contract, it will forever be this. The code is law. That is something you can do. Or you can do something different. If you want, when you create the smart contract, you can create a binding arbitration key at the same time. You have to do it when you create the smart contract. If you don't put the key there at the very beginning, you will forever have no key. But if you want to, you can create a smart contract with a key. And the key lets you overrule the smart contract. If you realize there was a bug in the code, you can change the code. If you don't like a transaction it did, you can undo it. You can completely change everything. So now the code is at law, you are safe from mistakes. But wait, that's centralized. <laughs> that undermines the whole purpose of a ledger. Why would you ever do that? Don't do that. But you can, we let you. But wait. That's a key in Hedera. Anywhere in Hedera you see a key, you are also allowed to do a threshold key. Ah, you could create a smart contract with millions of dollars in it, millions of H-bars in it, and then you could have a committee of people and only when most of the committee agrees will you undo something or change it. Or you can have hierarchical threshold keys, a committee of committees. You can set up an entire governance structure in this. And so only under special circumstances can they overrule the smart contract and you can lay that out. And again, Everybody knows it. There is no secret here. On the day you create the smart contract, everybody can see the key. If you create it this way, everyone knows you have a key and one person controls it. And if people don't like it, they won't use it. I don't like it. That's bad. That's centralized. This I like. This I like too. But I like this one more. And you can do that, and everyone will know. What if you want to change the key? Well, you can change this key, but only if you sign the change with this key. If you lose the key, you're out of luck. And you can change this key, but only if two of the three keys agree. So maybe if this one person loses their key, then these two could agree to change it to bring it back to them. So it is 
self-changing. You can change it over time. If you have this one, you can never change it. That smart contract is there forever. You can create new smart contracts that are different, but you can never touch this one. So you have the flexibility. You can do the code as law. You can have a dictator key, or you can have more like binding arbitration, governance, committees, um, binding arbitration judges that you, that you hire, trusted parties doing it. It is up to you when you create a smart contract. And there's no secrets. Anybody who uses your smart contract knows what you did. So that's something different, and that is in our API. If you go to our website, you can get the API, the, the Hedera API, H-A-P-I. We call it Happy. <laughs> so you can get Happy. Um, and if you look through it, you'll see all this stuff about hierarchical keys. It's recursively defined. For those of you that are technical, it's all protobuf. You like protobuf? I love protobuf. We have that. And then it has automatically generated documentation and you can read it. Now we also have SDKs that help you do higher level things. And you can download that. But the protobuf is for the raw messages and it's all documented there in the happy. Okay, so what else do we do that's kind of unusual? This is unusual. Hierarchical keys is unusual. Binding arbitration keys on smart contracts is unusual. What else would you find in the happy that is unusual? Well, here's one. Claims. This is a new thing. Here's an account. Alice has an account with H bars in it. Bob has a bank. Alice would like to send some H bars to Bob's bank. There are regulations in Bob's country. I don't know what country Bob is in, but there are regulations in his country that say there are certain rules about who is allowed to send money to your banks. Alice is good. Her, his, his country likes Alice. But Alice needs to prove to Bob that she's okay in that country. She's not a criminal in that country. So what they do is we get Carol. Carol runs a certificate authority, and Carol is able to talk to Alice, look at her documents, and verify that Alice is the kind of person that is allowed to use Bob's bank. Now, Hedera doesn't know any of this. This is just what they have to do between themselves in the country they're in. Every country is different, but for this particular case in Bob's country, Carol is going to be able to validate that Alice is okay. And then Carol can give Alice a certificate that she digitally signs that says Alice is okay. Alice is not a bad person. Alice is legally allowed to put things into Bob's bank. And Alice is old enough. Maybe if you're under 21, you're not allowed to put things in banks or under 18 or something, or maybe you need a parent's signature. So, when Alice goes to Bob's bank, she would give him this certificate. So far, nothing in Hedera is involved. The final transfer of the cryptocurrency is using Hedera, but all this other stuff is, has nothing to do with Hedera. But here's a problem. What happens if Alice breaks the law, becomes a bad person, and Carol is supposed to stop giving her certificates. Alice already has the certificate. How can Carol revoke it? We need some way to revoke credentials. If it was something like a driving license, driver's license, what happens if you lose your driver's license? You need to revoke it. So what we can do is put something called a claim into the account. In Hedera, an account that holds cryptocurrency can have claims attached to it. Think of this claim as just the hash of that certificate. That's all. The claim doesn't say anything. It's just a hash, just a cryptographic hash. The important thing about the claim, though, is that it is signed by Alice and Carol, 
both. But it can be removed by either one of them. So both Alice and Carol must sign to attach this claim to the account. But either one can pull it off. Alice is involved because it's her account. She should control it. Carol is able to remove it by herself because that's what revoking it is. If Alice does something bad, Carol can revoke the claim. From Hedera's point of view, we don't know what the claim is. It's just a hash. All we know is that this is the public key that attached it. So we not only have the claim attached to this account, we also have Carol's public key is part of the claim. The claim is just a hash and the public key from Carol. They both signed it when they attached it, and then either of them can sign a transaction to detach it, to delete it. So listen to what we're doing. We are not doing know your customer and, and filtering people and breaking anonymity. What we are doing is allowing other people to do it if they want to. If Alice wants to be verified in some way, she can do it and we will support it. If Alice wants to be anonymous, she can do it and we will support it. You can be anonymous or you can be not anonymous or you can be somewhere in between. If you want to, you could do a thing where the certificate is encrypted and only certain people can even read it. And only Alice has the certificate. The ledger doesn't have the certificate. All the ledger does is takes care of the revocation. These claims are the right way to handle user verification for, say, financial regulations in certain countries. We don't know what the law is. We don't care what the law is. We just allow you to do whatever you want to do. And if Alice doesn't want to do it, maybe she can't transfer to Bob's bank. Maybe she has to use a bank in a different country. That's up to Alice. So that's it for claims. I'm going to go through just one more thing. This is realms and short addresses. I just thought you might like to see what an address looks like. That's an address in our system. That's a real address. That is an account. We don't do unspent transactions, we do accounts. And accounts have an account number and they are short. It's just three numbers with dots. So this is a cryptocurrency account you can put cryptocurrency into. We also allow you to store smart contracts. A smart contract would look like this. We also let you store files. A file has an ID that looks like this. And the three numbers are the shard, the realm, and a number. Now, sharding we are not doing yet. Right now, we're running one shard. Everything is shard number zero. Someday, when we have more computers, we will run lots of shards. And that shard number will tell you which shard this account is in. So an account will live in a certain shard, which means certain computers will hold it. But right now we have one shard, so all the computers hold it. So anytime you want to send transfer cryptocurrency to an account, you have to know its shard number. That'll tell you which computers are holding that account. And then it has a sequence number that just makes sure that all the accounts have different numbers. We are not using a gigantic hash as the name. We are not using a gigantic key as the name. We're using these very short numbers as names. It saves bytes. It makes it easier to type in account numbers. What about Realm? What is that? That's a new thing. So on a single shard, so all the computers have it, you can have many different realms. And even today, when you create an account, you can decide what realm number it has. And in a sense, it doesn't do anything. If you want to send transactions to move uh, cryptocurrency between accounts, then you just have to know what this number is. It doesn't matter what the number is, you just have to know it. When you want to call a smart contract, 
You just have to know that number. It doesn't really matter what the number is. You, and then you can call the smart contract. The smart contract is written in Solidity. Solidity scripts are able to see accounts and interact with them. They have their own naming scheme. And we have a translation between naming schemes. And Solidity is not the best language. We've started with Solidity because it is a standard. We do plan to support other languages that are better. But Solidity has this interesting fact that you can't run smart contracts in parallel. Because when a smart contract accesses an account, if another smart contract accessed the same account, you would have problems. So it is serial. But when you think about it, that doesn't sound very good. The entire shard freezes while one smart contract is running. I don't like that. It'd be nice if we could run smart contracts at the same time. So what we do is we say, when you create a smart contract, when you create a, an account, you pick a shard number. And then when the smart contract is running, it only sees the things with the same shard number. Now, if you want, just pick zero. If you don't, want, don't care about this whole thing, pick zero and it'll act like what you're used to. But if you want to, you could create some things with shard number 42. I'm sorry, realm number 42. And then that smart contract could run at the same time as a smart contract somewhere else. And it might actually run faster. And um, you are charged less if it runs faster. So that's what the realms are for. Uh, it's an interesting feature. It's a new thing that we've added to allow smart contracts to run faster. Well, that's it. Uh, I'm going to stop there. I have a whole bunch more features. We can talk about it some other time if you're interested. Uh, there's lots of interesting things that are different about this ledger, but this is just a flavor, just to give you a flavor of things that we've done that are different. And um, in each case, you'll notice you can still do things the old way if you want. You don't have to be different. But if you want to, you can do something new. If you want to, you can do it the old way. Always use realm zero. Always use a single key, not a hierarchical key. Always build smart contracts without a key. If you want to do that, you can. But maybe you can find some uses for these new things. I'll be curious to see what you do. So thanks. So we have some time for questions.